Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I think, um, as is customary with all these sessions, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing three true experts in the finance business, let's call it. Starting with uh, Mr. Abdullah Afol, which is Vice President of Operation from ECOWAS. Please show your appreciation. That, yeah. We need to make some noise, don't we? Then um, the lovely Mariam Travali, Principal Investment Officer from International Finance Corporation. Oh, yes. Hello. And last but not least, Valentina Zisler, Vice President of, Opera Vice President of Hospitality and Tourism from DEG. Yeah. At least we have a very good, proactive, and awake audience. Fantastic. Please. Let's get straight into the topic. Let's keep our audience, we need to keep them awake more than anything. So let's get cracking. And um, development financial institutions, you know, I mean, or commonly referred to as development banks, as we see, but let's precise, we are development financial institutions. And uh, the, the big questions, what are development financial institutions looking for when entertaining financing? Mariam. OK, so. Um Yes, development banks, it's a name that we don't really like. We would rather say development financial institutions. So I would say that uh, given our mission, the first thing that we would look at when we want to support a hotel project is really the, the impact on the development. When I said impact on the development, I'm thinking of uh, the provision of quality business infrastructure, I mean quality rooms, quality meeting facilities, specifically in countries where the, there is a significant imbalance between the supply and the demand. So we do think that for those countries we have a role to play. The other thing that we would look at is really the benefits to the government, to the country. Benefits in terms of uh, tax payments and uh, also the creation of jobs jobs, direct jobs and indirect jobs, because as you know, in the hospitality sector, during the construction phase, there is a lot of linkages that can be created with all the small and medium enterprises working in the construction of the hotel, but as well during the operational phase of the hotel, all the food and services that you can buy locally. So all those synergies are very critical to DFIs like ours. Um, I would say this is the first point, really the development impact. The second thing on which we would really focus is the sponsorship. Who is behind the project? What is the reputation of the sponsor in terms of integrity, in terms of uh, commitment to the project, and uh, how deep his pockets are? Because we are talking about large projects and uh, we are really requesting a significant amount to be put on the table right at the beginning. And I would say the last thing on which we would, we would focus is really reasonable project cost. We don't want to come with fancy hotels, coming with, uh, I mean, uh, very expensive components, lands which are overvalued. Uh, and when I said reasonable project cost is as well cons with conservative financial structure. So uh, more or less, I would say these are the three things on which we would focus right at the beginning when we want to support a hotel project. Valentina, I know you wanted to add something to it. Please. Yes, Maria, maybe I can continue with your first point, and uh, you said it very nicely about what do we look for um, 
well, the sort of cornerstones of such a project to make it um, not only viable for us in the terms of that um, what it generates in terms of profits that it's able to pay back our debt service. But at the same time, we look at the effects that it has on the local markets. So it is very much the sort of community-based tourism concept that we like. Um, the more employment uh, can be created inside the head shell and outside, the better it is. So you mentioned supplies. Um, that is something where we like to see not only supplies, but perhaps also when we look at the interior design of the hotel, that we like to, rather than import um, certain bits and pieces, we like to look at um, what can be done so that it has a sort of African flair in itself, and that the more um, there is like, say, um, well, photographs, uh, like, like uh, paintings and all that, that it's, it's the local art that makes it typical. But so community-based tourism concepts, I think, are also very much going in the direction of educational effects. So I can give you as an example that very often we look at um, the sort of hands-on, hands-on education that you do, for example, in a learning restaurant. So rather than looking at education at the moment that the hotel opens its doors and becomes operative, we'd like to see something in front of it and look at um, could we perhaps educate people on the ground and see how in food and beverage can they actually um, further their knowledge by, by serving the guest um, the way he would like to be treated. Abdullah, so we had Mariam and uh, Valentina talking about what I would define responsible, sustainable, and ethical financing. You know, and, um, and, and this is the approach of, of the development financial institutions. Mariam may touch upon three things the sponsor, sensible project cost, and who is behind. You have a huge experience. You've been involved in this property. You've been involved in many other deals with African chain also, not only international. Who are the stakeholders involved in this, and what are the main challenges the development financial institutions faces? Merci. Thank you, Filippo. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Je vais venir d'abord sur la deuxième partie de la question, notamment sur les challenges que nous devons euh, attaquer face à un projet de financement dans le domaine. D'abord, euh, le premier panel en a parlé un peu, le capital. Euh, C'est-à-dire que quand un promoteur vient devant la banque, il doit en tout cas apporter une partie qui puisse être euh, considérée comme son apport, son implication personnelle. Quand c'est une start-up, forcément, les conditions vont être beaucoup plus rigoureuses. Donc, face à ce premier point -là, donc de capital, par exemple, on peut fixer un pourcentage, 30% d'apport ou 50% selon le cas. Mais ensuite, il faudra adresser toutes les questions liées à la gouvernance. Si c'est une société qui vient solliciter un prêt, il faut voir comment elle est organisée, est-ce que les structures fonctionnent correctement, il y a un commissaire au compte, il y a un conseil d'administration, etc. Donc cette structure de gouvernance-là doit être solide. Ensuite, il faut spécifiquement dans notre sous-région, les 15 pays que nous, nous couvrons, la CDAO, il y a une question importante qui est la question foncière. Euh, vous savez, euh, chez nous, le cadastre n'est pas encore ce qu'il doit être. Quand quelqu'un vous soumet un projet pour construire un hôtel, en tant que banque, on doit se poser la question et en tout cas euh, nous rassurer que la question foncière a été prise en compte. Ensuite, il y a tout ce qui est documentation technique dont nous avons besoin, euh, tout ce qui est business plan, les hypothèses qui ont été retenues pour les études de marché, etc. C'est des questions pour lesquelles souvent, malheureusement, nos promoteurs privés euh, africains n'ont peut-être pas toujours euh, les capacités requises pour, euh, en tout cas, rapidement euh, répondre à ces exigences-là. Ce qui fait que nous, en tant que banque de développement, il nous arrive de faire cet accompagnement technique, si vous voulez, de discuter, euh, d'améliorer la documentation avant de pouvoir continuer à, euh, disons, faire euh, l'évaluation du projet. 
euh, il y a les questions de garantie dont on a parlé tout à l'heure. Il faut, euh, ça demande souvent beaucoup de temps pour que les garanties soient mises en place, justement pour tout ce qui est euh, la question foncière dont j'ai parlé tout à l'heure, mais euh, les lenteurs administratives au niveau de nos tribunaux pour muter le titre foncier au nom de la société qui emprunte, ça peut prendre beaucoup de temps, mais forcément on n'attendra pas que toutes ces formalités soient terminées, mais en tout cas on doit euh, s'en assurer. Et un autre point également euh, que je voulais évoquer, ça concerne les montants. Mariam en a parlé un peu. Si le montant est très important, nous venons à un cofinancement. Ça veut dire chacune des banques qui intervient, en tout cas chacune des institutions, va s'assurer que le bouclage du capital est assuré, parce que sinon on va financer un projet qui va commencer à être exécuté, mais qui n'ira pas à la fin, parce qu'on n'aura pas on ne se sera pas euh, inquiété du bouclage du financement. Et euh, ce que je voulais dire, c'est que, en réalité, la meilleure garantie, c'est le projet en soi. Donc, un projet qui est bien fait, bien ficelé, à la limite, il va se payer de lui-même. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est peut-être ces, ces questions-là que je voulais aborder par rapport à, au challenge que nous avons en tant que banque, en tant qu'institution de financement de ce type d'activité. Philippe, euh, I don't know if I... Uh, I cover the point. C'est ce que je, je voulais en tout cas euh, dire pour commencer. S'il y a d'autres euh, préoccupations, je peux revenir là-dessus. Mais la question du capital est importante. La question foncière, en tout cas, dans notre sous-région, est extrêmement importante. Aujourd'hui, dans certains de nos pays, Côte d'Ivoire, Togo, etc., il y a des réformes, justement, pour faciliter euh, cette question foncière-là qui pose un problème extrêmement important. Euh, je vais prendre l'exemple de, de certains pays où la terre appartient à l'État. C'est plus facile en ce moment de faire toutes ces formalités de mutation. Mais si ça appartient, comme dans d'autres pays, à des populations, etc., ça demande beaucoup plus de, de temps pour que cette question soit réglée. Et on ne peut pas financer un projet si on n'est pas sûr que le terrain sur lequel on va construire l'hôtel n'est pas sécurisé. Donc c'est une question importante qu'on qu qu voit souvent sur les projets qui nous sont soumis. So if I understand correct, it's um, land ownership. So the right of the land ownership, when it's outside totally private sector, you know, and not necessarily, you know, government land, you know, that become a challenge. But you, you repeat it often about equity, land, and also guarantees, you know. Perhaps, you know, I think Mariam and Valentina, one of you please expand on the point of the equity and also What about the size of the deal? Do the financial institution, you know, finance unlimited, or what is the, the perfect, the sweet spot? I mean, for the size of the deal, I would say that, um, as you know, we have our internal procedures, which are not so light. I won't say that they are cumbersome, but they are not so light, and they are costly. So given that, um, the size of the deal shouldn't be too small. I would say maybe that we are talking about project costs of a minimum of 10 million US dollars, which is a lot for this region. But given, as I mentioned earlier, our procedures, our costly procedures, we cannot really go beyond, uh, below that. However, in some, um, I would say in some countries, in some environments, we are ready to make exceptions. But how low can we go? I would say that for sure, we will not look at a project, a, a hotel project cost which would be below five million US dollar. It doesn't make really sense for us uh, in terms of uh, project cost. In terms of uh, contribution, as it was mentioned, I think, earlier in, um, in the previous session, we will ask to the sponsor to contribute specifically for start a project up to 50% of the total project cost. And this 50% has to be mainly in cash. It cannot be uh, represented by 95% by the land cost, not at all. It has to be mainly in cash, land included. If it is an existing hotel which wants to, I mean, we need to modernize the facilities or expand the capacity, uh, then we would be slightly more, um, how can I say, we would go maybe for 40% of that amount, and us, Our institution, if it is 
a startup, as I mentioned earlier, we would limit our financing to 35% of the, of the total project cost. If we are talking about an existing hotel, if the clients can, the sponsor can put 40%, we can come with the other 40%, and the remaining will come from another DFI or commercial banks, because we like sharing the risk. Basically, this is how we work in terms of um, financing plan. I don't know if there was something, another question? No, no, no. Uh, it was that. Okay, thank you. Mariam, thank you for what you just contributed. I think it's extremely important to say that you do need a sort of critical mass um, in order to start looking at hotel projects. And we all know and hear how long it takes until you have the sponsor plus the operator plus um, whoever else is like the architect included, etc. cetera. Um, and when you then start opening, often you have, um, you know, you've, you've seen at least three years um, until, until everything is, is, is sort of together. However, I think there are also exemptions from this, and that I would see especially um, when you look at, let's say, smaller lodges. Um, the effect of financing lodges, I think, could be even greater than if you do hotels, when we come back to community-based tourism concepts. And as an example, um, when you look at the so-called uh, Casa region, which is the region between Angola, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, um, you have the big sort of national parks that have all been linked up. And um, our mother institution, KFW, um, has been chosen by the German government to finance the infrastructure within that region, sort of looking at national parks, looking at the animals all there. Um, and, and what we have in mind is in financing a sort of lodge-based concept there. But again, it brings me to the question of critical mass and size, and it only makes sense if you finance a package of several lodges rather than looking at a per se individual lodge. So that's where, you know, um, these, these sort of amounts um, become, become important and the possibility of replicating one investment after the other and then partnering up um, b amongst um, DFIs um, and, and financing something together um, with, with you, for instance. Uh, Abdullah also touched upon something about design. And uh, what would be interesting to know also, how much scrutiny or how much, you know, kind of involvement, you know, or how much do you look actually at the design of the hotel, whether the facility program is correct, you know, in order to deliver the money. But at the end of the day, a well-designed hotel, there is the assumption that it should, it should function well also. So I would be interested to know about this, about you know, how much that is taken into consideration in the decision-making criteria, number one question. Followed by another question, obviously employment is very key, contribution to the community. So if somebody puts more employment into his hotel, it's a very naive question, but you know, if we don't ask, we don't get, right? Would you have more chances to get a finance if I, if it, they say I need 100 people for my hotel, but normally, but I want to employ 120 to have a better quality of service, more people, that do I score more points? Or how, how does it, I know it is a simple question, but you know. Definitely, as I said earlier, the project has to generate jobs, but um, it's not because it will generate jobs that we will be really financing it. Of course, there are some financing criteria that we need to take into account. I mean, the economic and financial sustainability of the project at the end of the day is really what matters. Uh, because that project company would uh, get a loan from one or more than uh, or, or several DFIs or, or banks, I mean, from several lenders. At the end of the day, this project company has to repay the loan. So it means that the project has to generate enough uh, cash to meet all its obligations, financial and non-financial, I mean financial, when I said financial, I mean the banks, but as well all the suppliers and co, and pay as well those, those the staff, I mean those uh, people who are, who are really working for the, for the hotel company. 
So when you are mentioning the design and um, I mean what we are looking at, this is very, very important. Not only the design, I would rather talk about the project management. And this is a serious issue in our region. We have noticed, specifically these past years, that most of the hotels that we have supported, they really suffered from delays in opening. We used to say that a hotel can be built within uh, 24, 30 months, but real, the reality today is showing something different. We are rather on a trend of three years or even more. So I think the big question, and I think we have some uh, promoters in this room, is really to know whether the project management capacity is really within our region, or do we have really to import it? The, what we have noticing these days is that, unfortunately, to be within the time and the budget, we have to import it. So I think that something has to be done at the project management uh, level in, the, in, in, all the, in this region. Because, as I said, there is a delay. It impacts everything. It creates cost overruns. It's just a, a, a slight change in the design scope. Uh, a slight change in, um, or, or maybe you can have issues like uh, Ebola, what we, what we saw uh, recently in several countries of the region, or even just a social unrest. So all these have issues on the implementation of the, of the project and, of course, all the negative effects that it may have because we have already signed the loan agreement with the banks. Will the bank be ready to reschedule the loan? So all these are serious issues that we need to, to consider right at the beginning. So just to say that project management is really something on which we really focus, specifically for hotel projects. Please. Sur cette question, je voudrais, euh, par rapport au retard, je voudrais donner une petite... Euh, ça veut dire anecdote, on a financé un hôtel dans la sous-région, mais je veux dire, le matériel qui a été importé a mis peut-être trois mois au port avant de sortir. Et c'est des choses qui ont un coût. Donc pour dire qu'il y a peut-être des aléas que nous, en tant qu'institution, on ne maîtrise pas toujours. Ça, c'est important. Vous avez parlé tout à l'heure du temps que ça prenait même pour financer un projet. Euh, en tout cas, ce que je remarque, c'est que c'est souvent les différents allers-retours avec le promoteur qui nous retardent. Quand on demande un document, ça prend tellement de temps que c'est des choses qui viennent contribuer au retard du projet. Effectivement, Mariam l'a dit, on a financé beaucoup d'hôtels dans la sous-région, mais euh, les délais sont souvent dépassés. Euh, L'exemple, le success stories qu'on peut raconter, c'est cet hôtel qui a été conçu en 16 mois, mais euh, Saint-Il l'a dit tout à l'heure, ils se sont préparés longtemps en avance, la capacité était là. Donc, euh, voilà ce que je voulais ajouter par rapport à ce que disait ma collègue tout à l'heure. Maybe if I can add to that, um, Mariam, you, you mentioned the project manager. I think besides the project manager, what we normally face is that we see the sort of anchor investor who comes up with the real estate and who has the idea of setting something up on that real estate but he doesn't have sufficient equity and we need the cash in addition to that. So we need to make it doable, workable. So uh, very often we need additional equity partners to be put in place and they need to sort of be in harmony with, with, with the anchor investor himself. So there needs to be somebody who is who is um, logistically bringing all the players together. And I think this is also where the role of us as the DFIs is coming in, in, in looking at um, how do these partners, um, how are they in harmony with each other? How does it work? And I mean, very often we see that um, the anchor investor has certain ideas about who could be the operator of such a hotel or lodge. But he's then approaching so many of the different competitors that at some stage it becomes very sort of, well, um, difficult to, to see where is he progressing and, um, you know, what, which of the operators is he at the end choosing? I mean, in nowadays world, um, we are, I think, 
both agree that we are happy with different operating chains here, and there's not so much difference in many of them. But uh, we need, at the end, to come to terms and understand that timing concept. And the timing concept um, can, can actually be very, very tricky, and, and, and costs are rising the longer it takes. So I think that is where there is a key role also of additional equity players filling the gap at an early stage so that we can say we've done our sort of integrity check of the anchor investor, but also of the additional equity players. Qu quite an interesting conversation because um, is um, what transpires here, we talk about a lot about the project management, we talk about equity before, but I want to touch upon one thing. Do I have to be an hotelier or have experience in hotels to get money from a development financial institution or the likes of, you know, uh, Mossad and Balik, you know, me from Azalai, great experience, a great African brand, you know, I mean, so he has an amazing track record, but then comes another group like Kalyan, which I don't know whether they own hotels, but, and drop hundreds of millions of euros in here, you know, although again, the, the financial strength, the know-how in business is great, but do I have to be an hotelier or have experience in building hotels to get money, or what's the criteria here that you look into, specifically into that? Definitely, I would say this is, I would say number one. If you, if you don't have the experience in running a hotel, I mean, it, we will not be in a position to support you. But running a hotel doesn't have to be done by the sponsor himself. If he doesn't have the experience, he can work with an international or regional, whatever, hospitality company. I think, we, I think it was in the previous panels, or one of the previous ones, where we, ha we saw all these great names. I don't, need to, I don't need to mention them. With those international hospitality companies, definitely the marketing muscle will be here, the technical expertise will be here. But the accumulation of cost, can all these project companies support them? This is the big question. So I would say that if they cannot, there are other options. Why not hiring solid and seasoned management teams. You can find in the region or even in other countries or even uh, yeah, other regions, I would say, outside sub-Saharan Africa, people who really have the experience and they can come and uh, constitute a solid management team and run the hotel. You mentioned uh, the Azalai Group, it's true. I think, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Bali just went uh, out of the, of the room. He can tell you that at the beginning he was not an, an, a, a hotelier. How did he build this great uh, group and being today present in more than, I think, uh, five or seven countries? So definitely, yes, operation is key, but who will be behind that? Will it be an international management uh, group or will it be uh, constituted by a team of seasoned people. But definitely IFC, I mean, our institution, International Finance Corporation, we would need a solid operator behind that. Question for you, uh, Valentina. So is it, is, um, what do you call it, let's drop the bomb. Is the brand really necessary for financing? That's, uh, that's a good question, and it's tricky to answer that one because I don't know who is in this room at the moment, but <laughs> I would say it depends, of course, on the situation. And as Mariam said, I mean, if you have an owner who has own experience um, in hotel and catering, who comes from the background, why should he not do it himself? If it is a small size um, of a hotel or a lodge, I would definitely say that's possible. If, however, we speak about um, hotels in a range and size that are huge, then I would say no. They definitely need, in order to fill their rooms, they need, they need the brand, they need behind it um, um, the hotel operating company. Um, and uh, so maybe there is no yes or no answer to it. It does depend on the situation, but very definitely, I think 
the educational effects that we can bring into that project can be immense if we look at, you know, rather than training, um, just training stuff we, we, before opening, looking at, you know, how many opening managers do we need um, in that hotel? What is the expat um, sort of uh, level that is, that is required? And what can be done locally? Because the people who regionally are there have the contacts. And if you think of the my segment, then we definitely want to be able to be in touch with the locals there and see what can be arranged. Before we lead in into questions, from the audience, so prepare your questions because I'm coming, you know, and ask, and please ask questions to these guys. Uh, but uh, I want to leave the last thought for Abdullah. And, and the reason being is because I'm a great fan of Togo. And uh, for the past six years, I've been coming to African conferences and everywhere. And uh, everybody talks about Nigeria, everybody talks about Ghana, everybody talks about Ethiopia, everybody talks about Kenya. But guess what? Come the Togolese and they open a hotel in record time with world-class facilities. So let's be honest, you know what I mean? In all the supply pipeline we've seen in the last three or four years, this is the only hotel that I personally, I've read as a pipeline and I'm staying as a guest, you know, in the last six years. So, but I want to ask you a challenging question to you because you were supportive and brave to support and finance a project of this magnitude in our lovely Togo, Lome. So what gave you the confidence as a development institution, financial institutions, to participate in this? And what are the key things you looked at and saying, yes, this is gonna work? Thanks so much. Merci, Filippo. Uh, vous savez, quand on a été approché pour ce projet spécifique du Radisson Togo, on avait déjà financé d'autres Radisson, notamment Dakar, et on travaillait sur euh, Lagos, etc. Mais on ne pouvait pas, ne pas, en tant que banque de développement, participer à ce projet-là, qui est d'une importance pour nous capitale, parce que l'offre d'hôtels de ce niveau fait défaut dans nos pays. Et en tant que banque de développement, il nous arrive, nous, dans certains pays, d'être le lead, en tout cas de provoquer qu'on puisse avoir ce type d'hôtel. Pourquoi Quand on a un hôtel de référence de ce genre, les hommes d'affaires qui viennent pour traiter, pour d'autres secteurs, hein, seront plus à l'aise pour faire le travail qu'ils sont venus faire. Donc je veux dire, euh, aller dans un pays où vous n'avez même pas une structure hôtelière qui va vous recevoir, mais ça n'encourage pas l'investissement, sans compter tous les autres avantages qui vont avec. On a parlé de la création d'emplois, mais de la formation. Il faut que nos pays également soient formés. Donc, euh, en gros, euh, on ne pouvait pas être banque de développement basée au Togo et passer à côté d'un projet aussi important. Coming to this point, any questions? Uh, I've seen quite a few hands. I'm coming. Duada? Can you hear me? Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dauda Jawara. I'm a lawyer. Um, I cover Sub-Saharan Africa for a firm called Clyde & Co. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, first is for Mariam and, and Valentina. We know that the role, one of the roles of the, the, the DFIs is to bring in partners, um, particularly financing partners in, um, in, in making projects viable. I wondered what um, what IFC and DEG are doing in terms of using a lot of local liquidity, and there's a lot of local liquidity that could be used in developing things like hospitality and infrastructure that isn't being used um, and, is, and is idle. Um, so what are the development financial institutions doing in terms of um, using that idle money to bring, um, to bring about infrastructure de development? And my second question is for, um, for Mr. Fall. We know that in East Africa, um, the, the East African Union seems to be far more integrated and there's local demand from within East Africa. And I think we have to say that in West Africa, we're a little bit behind that. So um, the, the countries in West Africa seem to operate in, in a far more isolated fashion. 
what is ECOWAS doing to integrate the, the region so that um, domestic demand is stimulated and we can um, move a bit closer to our East African brothers. So maybe for the first question, uh, I think as I mentioned earlier, we like sharing the risk. We don't want to be the only one supporting a hotel project or any project. So it's the reason why we are working with DFIs like uh, DG and others. But even before contacting DG, we even prefer to work with the banks who are really on the site. Because as you know, you mentioned IFC, yes, it's, uh, <laughs> I work for IFC. As you know, we are not a bank with the accounts. So when a sponsor or any company comes to us, we don't have, we don't see the cash coming in or the cash coming out. It's the commercial bank which will see it. And we really rely on the commercial bank to really understand the business of the group or of the company of, or, or of the person. So definitely yes, uh, the, the first uh, door I would say of entry would be really the financiers who are, on, who are locally based. So I hope that I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, just to, to perhaps still add to what you, what you said, um, besides, besides um, being complementary to uh, the local banks, there is also the issue of working capital. And working capital um, becomes important very early in the process. And, and I think it will always be, um, you know, something one shouldn't forget that um, the local banks, when it comes to the working capital lines, um, are of major importance. So, euh, j'ai ai bien aimé la question, mais c'est vrai que en matière d'intégration, on a encore beaucoup d'efforts à faire euh, par rapport à l'Afrique de l'Est que vous citez. Mais euh, il faut également reconnaître qu'on a beaucoup fait. La BIDC a deux, deux guichets, un guichet public et un guichet privé. Le guichet public prête aux États pour faciliter justement toutes les infrastructures, euh, les routes, etc., pour que la mobilité soit une réalité. Parce que si on ne fait pas un commerce intra, ce n'est pas avec le commerce de l'étranger qu'on va se développer. Ça, c'est un. Et c'est pour ça que la BIDC a financé Ascai, justement, compagnie aérienne qui permet de faire le link entre les villes. Avant, il n'y en avait pas. Et également, Ecobank était... Euh, en tout cas, la BIDC est membre fondateur d'Ecobank, justement, pour faciliter. C'est vrai. Dans l'intégration, on a encore des efforts à faire, mais on est en train. Je pense que c'est une question qui touche beaucoup plus la branche politique. Aujourd'hui, à la CDAO, on va avoir une carte d'identité unique, numérisée, pour faciliter les mouvements des biens et des personnes. Merci. Thank you so much. There's one more question here, in the front. We have a great opportunity. Think about the question. I'm coming back after the gentleman. Come on, we need two more questions. Thank you. This was a very interesting uh, panel. I would like to ch challenge the panelists a little bit. I mean, listening to you, it seems to me that, uh, I mean, only the investor that is ready, that can tick on all the boxes, can actually come to IFC or DEG. Uh, it seems to me that uh, in this room, you probably won't have a lot of clients, uh, because most of the people that are starting uh, would not meet the kind of criteria you are establishing. And to me, there's a bit of contradiction with your overall mandate, your development institution, you're supposed to take risk, you're supposed to handhold. Now, how do you reconcile these two? I mean, if you guys are asking commercial banks to take risks, and you as development banks, even if you don't like to be called that way, you're part of the World Bank Group, I mean, you're part of KFW, you're not taking the kind of risk that you're asking commercial banks to take with SMEs and so on. So I see a bit of contradiction there. And I think Filippo asked the right question when he said, you know, who actually can be your client? Because if I had 50% capital, if I could tick on all these boxes, if I had an hotel, a hotel experience, I would not come to you. I would go to a bank, I would go to investment fund, I would go to, you know, a pension fund, whatever. There's a lot of money flowing around the continent looking for good projects. And if these projects are good enough to be funded by IFC or DEG, they're probably good enough to be funded by others who are going to take less time to actually instruct this project, 
and we're actually going to be facilitate them a little bit more. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing, I used to be in a development bank, I used to be World Bank. I'm no longer, so I can speak freely. Keep but, throwing but the punches, <laughs> keep throwing the punches, that's good. <laughs> But I think this is, a, this is a contradiction that I think as development banks we need to reconcile with the daily reality that small investors face. If you come to Togo, you come to West Africa, you're not going to get that investor that can tick on all of these boxes. And you're going to fund Azalai, a eighth hotel, a tenth hotel for Azalai, while you have other promoters that can come in with a two-star hotel, a three-star hotel in Kara, in smaller cities, so you can spread development. So I think you really need to look at your business model to be able to take a little bit more risk, be a little more supportive downstream, and, and so that you can, you know, when you have that guy that can tick on the 50% and all of that, you fund them. But I think you also need to have an action towards those that do not have 50, maybe they have 25, maybe they don't have a tell experience, but they can, you know, you can faire or faire faire, as we say in French. So I think that your model would be, um, you know, would only be palatable to the client that is already sophisticated and in fact has many other financing opportunities. And I really think you need to think about it. Thanks. Please. Hello. Actually, um, when I was talking about this 10 million US dollar or the 5 million US dollar as a threshold, this is the projects that we will be financing directly. What we do as IFC, and I guess that all the DFIs do that, we work directly with the commercial banks by granting them with lines of credit. As I said earlier, the commercial banks are the ones who are dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with the sponsors, and more specifically with the small sp sponsors, the SMEs and even some micro, micro enterprises. Today, as uh, DFIs, I don't think that we have the right tools, the adequate tools, uh, to work directly with the SMEs or the micro enterprises today. It's the reason why we are giving lines of credit which are dedicated, that can be dedicated to the tourism sector, they can be uh, dedicated to other subsectors, agribusiness and OCO. And these banks, these commercial banks, have the, the I would say, the duty to on land to those. SMEs which will, with, whom, with which they can work directly. As I said earlier, uh, we have cumbersome procedures. We are asking for audited financial statements. Do you think that a small or a micro enterprise can go and pay, let's say, an uh, auditing firm which, with a big names and, need, and needs that prerequisite to come and work with IFC? The commercial bank will be less demanding so we do believe that they have the role, they should play that role. So us, as, uh, as uh, DFIs, we come, I would say, upstream, given, giving this money to, the, to this commercial bank so that they can unlend them. But you can tell me as well that maybe the commercial banks do not have internally the capacity to analyze those um, credit uh, documents or whatever. In addition to the lines of credit that we are giving to those commercial banks, we come as well with some capacity building initiatives, which means training the staff themselves in, the, in those banks, I would say. And even, I would add that for those lines of credit, we even try to, um, uh, how can I say, to add a women component, a gender component. We can say that out of these, I don't know, these uh, 10 million US dollars that we are lending to you guys, to this bank, we would like 30% of them to be dedicated to SMEs or to micro enterprises managed by women. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to respond, I would say, to the demand, we are trying our best. It's true that it's not the most, uh, how can I say, the best, um, the best way, but uh, it, these are things that we are really focusing on. And uh, so far, I would say that the utilization rate is not too bad. Maybe I can still add one, one point to this. Um, first of all, um, as DFIs, uh, we, are, we are not supposed and we do not compete, we do not want to compete with the commercial banks. 
Um, I think we look at the role that we as a DFI have in addition to um, a commercial bank and when you look at tenors that commercial local banks can offer, they are usually not of the same length. And so when we look at how long does it take to finance um, a hotel, we often talk about um, a tenor of 12 or 13 years. So, so that is something that is, I think, adding value. Besides that, when we think of what must be done before a project is viable and realizable, um, we have to think of feasibility studies. We have to think of what can be done in order to make a project better. And we identify certain bits and pieces where we say, for instance, installing solar energy or thinking of any environmental aspects. What can we do to, to still you know, add on value? And this is something where we can also provide technical assistance and, and see that with the help of that technical assistance, and we touched a lot on education, educational effects, um, we, we do have a certain role that a commercial bank simply in that case cannot take. But we can, together with that commercial bank, then think of what Mariam des, uh, described uh, when we think of, you know, for instance, um, a special credit line that works in many directions for installing solar power on, on hotel roofs. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, I do apologize, there's a wonderful surprise which uh, I leave for Matthew to say, but please join me in thanking the panelists and also all the people that have asked the question. Thank you very much.